four three two one one hello and good morning did everyone have a good valentine's day i know i'm still riding the high of all the loving i got oh yeah this morning i happened across an interview with two people opening up about how they found success in the podcast industry i'm like okay cool maybe i'll learn a thing or two they're talking 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 and finally, the interviewer asks, so what was the most crucial part of finding success for you? Um, well, once we started posting clips of our videos to our TikTok platform, we really started to see exponential growth. Well, it turns out their TikTok platform was already quite famous, and then they just also wanted a podcast. So yeah, I'll just go get TikTok famous really quick. <laughs> Basically, zero real advice. Maybe I'll just start a newsletter. Those are hot. Anywho, shall we get into it before I bore you all away? Today, I bring you the strange murder of Lord William Russell. My name is Eli, and this is Murder in the Morning. My sources for today come from berkeley.edu, Wikipedia, a lady called Jerry Walton, and her entire website, and the rest I'll list below. I found it kind of funny. Victorian era England was obsessed with death and everything surrounding it, and now I feel our generation has its own fascination for that particular Victorian obsession. The Victorian era in British history, according to Britannica, is the period between roughly 1820 and 1914. It corresponds roughly, but not precisely, to the period of Queen Victoria's reign, which was 1837 to 1901, and is often characterized by a class-based society, growing number of people voting, and a growing state and economy, plus Britain's status as the most powerful empire in the world. Why the Victorian area was gripped by death can be explained by a multitude of factors, none of which I really knew much about before doing this research. According to berkeley.edu, quote, The Victorians are known for their prudish and repressed behavior, but few are aware of their almost fanatical obsession with death. And no one was more fixated than the era's namesake, Queen Victoria. She elaborately mourned the death of her husband, Prince Albert, for 40 years. Dressing in black every day and keeping their home exactly as it was the day that he died, said Carol Christ, executive vice chancellor and expert on Victorian death. Each morning, servants set out Albert's clothes, brought hot water for his shaving cup, scored his chamber pot, and changed the bed linens. The glass from which he took his last dose of medicine stayed by his bedside for nearly four decades. A bust or a painting of the prince was also included in nearly every photographic portrait of the royal family, prominently displayed among the children and relatives posing for the photo or picture. Photo, painting, picture. While modern sensibilities may deem this behavior odd and peculiar, it was considered the norm in the 19th century, said Carol Christ. Because of high mortality rights in Victorian England, death and mourning became a way of life for survivors. Quote, These days, nearly 80% of deaths happen in hospitals, not in the home. So we are removed from this process. In London, in 1830, the average lifespan for middle to upper class males was 44 years, 25 years for tradesmen, and 22 years for laborers. 57 out of every 100 children in working class families were dead by the age of 5. End quote. Death was a common domestic fact of life for these Victorians, she said, so they developed elaborate rituals to deal with it. The deathbed became a focal point for families who were in the process of losing a loved one. Typically, one or more grieving relatives would surround the bed, waiting to hear the last words signifying the transition from this world to the next. The Victorians valued last words, said Carol. In fact, the use of narcotics was discouraged to keep the dying as lucid as possible 
in the hopes of hearing a climatic testimony to the meaning of life. These scenes were highly dramatized in much of the literature and artwork of the time. For example, Charles Dickens devoted numerous chapters from his novels to prolonged deathbed watches. Weird. Photographs, death masks, and portraits of the recently deceased were also produced, as well as jewelry that utilized a locket of the dead person's hair. Carol Christ said the houses were filled with mementos. It was almost fetishistic? Feti fetishistic. After the loved one had passed, women were expected to follow a complex code of mourning that lasted for two and a half years. For 12 months and one day, they wore a plain black dress made of a drab blended fabric covering their entire body, including a cap. A black ribbon was tied to their underwear. After two months, two flounces, or ribbons, could be added to the skirt. After one year, the woman could switch their dress fabric to a silk colored in lavender, mauve, or violet, basically purple, and they were also forbidden from socializing during these 28 months. Which is basically just COVID, so... Easy. Hashtag take me back. Not only was it easy to recognize who was in mourning, but you could also tell for how long. These days, no one would ever know if someone recently lost a loved one. From our modern point of view, it's very easy to tease these rituals. But Christ said that Victorian... Carol Christ, said that Victorian culture recognized death as an integral part of life and they maintained an honest understanding of loss and grief. Modern society, however, has a tendency to deal with death in more medical terms. We don't die any differently now than back then, said Carol, but how death is represented has changed drastically. Victorian rituals provided stability and refuge in the face of sweeping changes, she went on to say. The era was characterized by scientific progress and challenges to religion during this time, including Darwin and the theory of evolution. Mourning, said Carol, created a powerful sense of being bound to the loyalty of the past. End quote. I tell you all this for two reasons. One, it explains some particularly odd behaviors or themes throughout our story. And two, I honestly found it fascinating. Okie dokie. Lord William Russell was born in England on August 20th of 1867 to Francis Russell, the fourth Duke of Bedford. William was the youngest of three brothers, all Dukes of Bedford as well. As a young adult, he married Lady Charlotte, daughter of an Earl, with whom he shared seven children. Lady Charlotte would die shortly after giving birth to her, la to her last child in 1808. Lord Russell was known to carry a locket with her hair inside everywhere he went. According to Wikipedia, as with many members of the Russell family, notably his nephew, the future Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, William was a Whig politician. Whig, with an H, is a term for a British political party. It's my belief right now, um, as an American, that the Whig party is just the people that wear those big, curly, fuzzy white wigs and then the other party it is, doesn't. Russell served as a longtime member of Parliament from 1789 to 1831, and throughout his political career, he did little to attract attention, basically keeping his head down and not stirring the pot like that crazy person burning books in Oklahoma. Although a retired po po politician, Russell remained a lord and of course maintained a lavish lifestyle. He sequestered himself to his cozy residence on Dunraven Street, formerly known as Norfolk Street, in the Mayfair district of London. Mayfair is, and has almost always been, an expensive and affluent neighborhood. Today, at least according to Wikipedia, it is one of the most expensive districts in the world. And when I read that, of course I had to look it up, According to home.co.uk, the average monthly rent in Mayfair today is £8,333, or $10,500. You'd basically be buying a new home every year, except you don't own it. 
my goodness. Um, where were we? Do, 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 do. Quote, on the morning of May 5th, May 6th, on the morning of May 6th, 1840, Russell's housemaid, Sarah Manser, discovered the lower floors of the house in Norfolk Street, now called Dunraven, in disarray. She was going about her normal duties when she discovered one of the sitting rooms had Lord Russell's papers strewn all over the carpet. Concerned, Manser began to further investigate. She discovered several things tied in a bundle near the hall door and also found the dining room disturbed. It had knives, several silver candlesticks, and other silver things sitting on the floor. At this point, she rushed to inform the cook, Mary Hannell. Then she routed Lord Russell's valet, a Swiss man by the name of Francois Benjamin Corvassier. And I hope I'm saying that right. According to Jerry Walton, Manser and Corvassier proceeded to Rus Russell's bedroom. There, they were greeted by a, quote, melancholic catastrophe. It was a horrible, astonishing sight. Lord William Russell had been barbarously and inhumanely murdered. He was lying in bed, his pillow soaked with blood, a white napkin over his face, and his throat slit. The horror-stricken servants immediately rushed from the room to a neighboring house where a surgeon resided named Henry Ellsgood. He returned with them and examined the body, noting, quote, an extensive wound extending from the shoulder on the left side round to the trachea was about seven inches in length and about four or five inches deep. The surgeon surmised that Lord William Russell had been dead for about three or four hours. He also remarked that whoever killed Russell likely used a razor or some sharp instrument. So, a search was conducted by the servants to find this instrument of death, but nothing was discovered. Russell was lying on his back, partially inclined to the right side. Based on this and the fact that his bedclothes and bedding were barely disturbed, Henry Ellsgood decided that the struggle was minimal. He suggested Russell had been awakened by the thief or thieves and murdered to prevent him from crying out in an alarm. Additionally, Ellsgood maintained that because of the severity of the wound, it was likely Russell died immediately and did not suffer." End quote. In the meantime, Police were summoned to the residence and were immediately curious about this so-called burglary. First of all, I don't know why the servants started searching before the police, but maybe they were just that loyal. Many pieces of gold and silver, along with banknotes, were missing from the room, but these were soon found hidden throughout the house. Obviously, a burglar would have taken these with them upon leaving. So the police continued searching the house, looking for anything out of place. After hours of meticulously combing the house, police found a loose board hidden within a pantry. When they pulled it back, several more pieces of gold fell onto the floor. The pantry in question was located within the valet's accommodations, Francis Corvassier. Immediately, he was arrested and thrown into the brig. Defended by counsel Charles Phillips, his trial would begin within weeks. And initially, the fight seemed fair. Sure, the defendant had hidden gold belonging to the murdered victim in his possession, but couldn't that have been taken at any point? Does it mean he murdered this man the few weeks before? Plus, where was all the blood? Investigators weren't able to find any traces of blood on Francois's clothing, even though slashing a man through his neck would seemingly spray, spray blood everywhere. Soon, expanding their search, police found more missing silver and jewelry in a nearby hotel room of a maidservant that had worked at the house. Her involvement in this killing was heavily questioned, and Francois, for the first time, felt something. He confessed to the murder of Lord William Russell to his lawyer, claiming he didn't want an innocent person to go down for the crime. Eventually, and under extreme pressure from his counsel, Francois relayed this confession to the courtroom. Quote, It emerged in Francois's confession that Russell had discovered his silverware thefts and ordered Corvassier to resign from the household, so he had been stealing prior to the death. Rather than lose his position, Corvassier decided to conceal the matter by murdering Russell. The lack of blood on Corvassier's clothes was then explained. He had committed the crime naked. 
that that was the only sentence out of all like the quotes and whatnot I have used over the past year that I had not read beforehand, and I was not expecting that. So, I mean, honestly, <clears throat> props. Corvassier had reportedly read William Harrison Ainsworth novel Jack Shepard in the days leading up to the crime, and several news reports implied that the novel's glorification of a criminal life had led him to commit the murder. However, those allegations were never actually brought up in the court's defense or prosecution. Francois was publicly hanged outside Newgate Prison on July 6th of 1840. Charles Dickens was among the estimated crowd of over 40,000 who had attended. Also present was the novelist William Makepeace Thackeray, who my mother would probably know. He subsequently wrote an anti-capital punishment essay titled On Going to See a Man Hanged. He wrote, quote, I came away that morning with a disgust for murder, but it was for the murder I saw done. I feel myself shamed and degraded at the brutal curiosity that took me to that spot, end quote. According to Jerry Walton, the crowd began forming hours before the execution, like Black Friday-type waiting. Before midnight, spectators began to assemble in front of Newgate to obtain a good spot to witness the upcoming drama of Francois' execution. Just like they had when the London Burkers and Elizabeth Ross were executed years earlier, the spectators also coalesced into a dense mass extending from street to street. At two o'clock, the spectators watched as workers constructed the gallows, finishing them around 4.30 a.m. Hours later, at eight o'clock, the death bell rang. The death bell. The death bell rang. And that was followed by a solemn funeral procession, during which Corvassier looked pale, but calm and quite firm. Francois proceeded staunchly forward through the prison's dark and gloomy passageways to his execution point. When at last he appeared at the scaffold, the crowd roared, end quote. Woo! Yeah! After a few fateful moments, the executioner dropped the floor, and Francois Corvassier met his demise. It was said he convulsed a few times, and then lay silent, where his body hung for hours after he mm, mm, probably pooped his pants. And that, my friends, is the murder of Lord William Russell. Real quick, a passage above mentioned Newgate Prison, and it had popped up a few times prior in my research. This place has a wild history of its own. The prison was built in the 12th century and remained in use for over 700 years before its demolition in 1904. Quote, in 1783, the site of London's gallows was moved from Tyburn to Newgate. Public executions outside the prison, by this time, London's main prison, continued to draw immense crowds. Crowds of thousands and thousands of spectators could pack the streets to see these events like it did in our story above, and in 1807, dozens died at a public execution when the crowd of nearly 50,000 spectators stampeded, collapsed, and ran over hundreds of people. Like Black Friday. In total, publicly or otherwise, 1,169 people were executed at this prison. End quote. What a wild time to be alive. At least for like 20 to 35 years at least. Gosh, we would have fit in so well. I already wear black 90% of the time. I want like a death shrine. That sounds cool. Either one of me when I die or a death shrine of like Gibby from iCarly going Gibby. <laughs> I don't know. Alrighty then. Another Victorian classic in the books. Sorry if you're not into this as not in sorry if you're not as into this era as I am, because I'm definitely sticking around for a bit. Oops. Thanks again for taking the time out of your day to listen. It really means the world. As usual, stick around for a bo bo bonus story after some peaceful elevator music. Okie dokie. Bye bye. Love you. And.
and we are back. Titled The Twisted Life of Clark Rockefeller, the elite con man who got away with murder for nearly 30 years. Written by Wyatt Red of All That's Interesting. Quote, in 1996, Clark Rockefeller married a successful businesswoman named Sandra Boss, who was seven years his junior. As Rockefeller was proud of boasting, he was a descendant of the famous Rockefeller family. But despite his connection to one of the richest families in the world, he didn't seem to have any access to the Rockefeller's wealth. Nor had the Rockefeller ever held a steady job, bouncing around Wall Street from firm to firm, before becoming what he called a, quote, freelance banker, working to solve third world debt. Instead, Clark Rockefeller funded a lavish lifestyle entirely on his wife's income. He needed her money to buy his extensive art collection, antique cars, and hand-tailored suits, because he didn't actually have any money of his own. And the lies he consistently told mounted up. Boss began to suspect that she didn't know her husband at all. As it turns out, she was right. Because her husband's name wasn't Clark Rockefeller, it was actually Christian Gerhardtsreiter. Gerhardtsreiter? And he was hiding a complicated and murderous past. Christian Hans G. was born in the Bavarian town of Bergen, Germany in 1961. At the age of 17, he left home and moved to the United States, telling the immigration authorities at JFK Airport that an American couple had offered to let him stay with them while he went to school in the U.S. That was a half-truth. Christian had in fact met an American family on a train in Germany who offered to put him up if he ever found himself in Berlin, Connecticut. But the Savio family had no idea that he was actually coming. When he arrived at their door, he somehow convinced them to let him stay for months as a foreign exchange student. Christian told his adoptive family that he was the son of a European aristocrat, and his refusal to do even basic work around the house, including making breakfast for himself or doing his own laundry, quickly began to bother the family, and soon they kicked him out. Rather than return to Germany, he found more, quote, host families to live with. But Christian soon outgrew small-town New England and decided to do two things. Make his immigration status permanent and head to California to become an actor. By 1980, Christian had changed his name to Chris Gerhardt and found himself auditing classes at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. There, he met and married a woman named Amy J for a green card on February 20th, 1981. Within weeks of the wedding, he was gone. By the time he reached California, he was calling himself Christopher Chichester or Chichester, sometimes adding Mountbatten as a middle name to add to his pedigree. And he handed out business cards that called himself the 13th Baronet, complete with a fake family crest. Soon, he managed to ingratiate himself into the L.A. suburb of San Marino and found an elderly and reclusive woman named Dee Dee Sohus to let him move in with her. He audited classes at the University of Southern California Film School and convinced a local TV station to give him a public access show, according to the New York Times. I, sorry to interrupt, I just, I rearranged my room the other day and I don't like having my shades down because the sun helps me wake up and now my desk is facing the window and I, it's, people stare at me when I'm recording. Anywho, the situation quickly became more complicated when Dee Dee's son, John, and his wife, Linda, moved in. Jonathan soon began asking questions about his mother's guest and the way he seemed to be using her for her money to buy expensive clothing for himself. Then in 1985... Jonathan and Linda suddenly disappeared. According to Christian, they had been called away on urgent business to Europe. Soon, this Christopher Chichester or Christian G or whoever he was disappeared as well. He eventually turned up back in Connecticut, where he tried to sell John Soha's car without registration. In Connecticut, now under the name Christopher Crow he talked his way into a position as an executive at a brokerage firm. Soon he was fired after the company discovered the social security number he gave them actually belonged to convicted serial killer David Berkowitz. 
New York's Son of Sam. First of all, how did that not pop up as a red flag right away? Like as a, a hiring practice, don't you just, isn't that step one, put the social in? And it comes back as David Berkowitz. <sighs> oh boy. And then they they were probably embarrassed, so they didn't tell any of the other firms because he managed to secure two other highly paid jobs before the discovery of a corpse thought to be Jonathan Sohas in San Marino in 1994. This led police to begin looking for Christopher Crow in connection with the murders. But by that time, Christian had already been living as now Clark Rockefeller for two years. So many names, I know it's confusing, but only a couple are important. Christian reinvented himself yet again, claiming to be James Frederick, James Frederick Mills Clark Rockefeller, from a lesser-known branch of the Rockefeller family. Using this identity, Christian found that he could impress the wealthy upper-class circles that he had moved in with. And in 1993, he met Sandra Boss at a cocktail party in New York City. She quickly fell in love with this charming young Rockefeller. But over a decade of marriage, Clark Rockefeller became increasingly controlling and occasionally violent. Many people close to the couple be began questioning why none of the stories about his past added up. In 2006, Boss hired a private investigator to look into Rockefeller's background, her own husband. And when she discovered that he had been lying for years about who he was, she filed for divorce. Christian settled for $800,000 and tried to avoid anyone looking too hard into his real identity. And he also agreed to only three visitations with his daughter per year. Everything in this man's life was a lie, journal said journalist Mark Seal, who wrote a book on this man. The only thing real in his life was the love of his daughter. And when he lost his daughter in a bitter divorce, he began plotting plotting how to get her back. After a court-supervised visit in Boston, Christian managed to shake off the social worker and abducted his daughter. Once more, Christian changed his name and identity, this time to a sea captain called Chip Smith, and headed to an apartment in Baltimore. Luckily, the FBI managed to track him down, and according to NBC, they lured him out of the apartment by telling him that his catamaran was sinking at the marina. How he got a catamaran, I don't know. As soon as he left his apartment, agents surrounded him. Luckily, his daughter was unharmed. Initially, Christian G., a.k.a. Clark Rockefeller, was given a seven-year prison sentence for the abduction. But shortly after the trial, police began building a case against him for the murder of Jonathan Sohas back in 1985. And in 2013, Christian was given a life sentence in prison for the murder, proving that not even a man with an incredible gift for deception can escape the truth forever. End quote. And that, my friends, is the story of con man Clark Rockefeller, a.k.a. Christian Gerhardstreeker. I hope you all enjoyed today's stories, and I will see you pretties on Monday. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Love you.